Well, I hope you had a fabulous day yesterday. You know, this summit is really for you. And I'm so glad that you're here to enjoy it. I spent about three hours last night just walking the aisles of the showcase and you know, really talking to many of you. And I am pumped up. I'm just blown away by the creativity and the entrepreneurship that I witnessed. This is spectacular. This is American innovation at its best. This is really inventing the future. And from what I said yesterday, the future is really here. Now, all of this could not have happened without the support of today's first speaker, who I call one of the fathers of RPE. He was instrumental in tasking the National Academies to look into U.S. competitiveness, which led to the Gathering Storm Report and the America Competes Act, which authorized RPE. We all greatly appreciate your support for research and innovation throughout your career, and we are particularly thankful for your support of RPE. Please join me in welcoming Senator Jeff Bingaman. Arun, thank you for the very kind introduction, and uh, it's great to be here, and congratulations on this uh, third very successful summit. Uh, congratulations to you and to Secretary Chu as well. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. All of us know that science and innovation are fundamental in shaping our energy future. We also know that as a nation we are not spending what we should on research and development in the energy sector. Uh, so the investments that we do make amount to something like 0.3% of sales, a very small uh, percentage compared to the pharmaceutical industry, where research and development uh, approaches 19% of sales, computers and electronics, uh, which is closer to 9%. And yet we've seen that innovation and energy can have revolutionary impacts on energy markets. Perhaps the most recent and dramatic example of this is the advent of new subsurface imaging and drilling technologies in the search for natural gas and oil. Five years ago, it was thought that the United States was running out of oil and gas. We were preparing to construct significant numbers of import terminals for liquefied natural gas to be brought to our shores from around the world. But thanks to the combination of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing techniques, we are now looking at an immense new supply of natural gas, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Further, the application of the same techniques that are used in natural gas to oil-rich unconventional geologic formations has reversed a decade-long, decades-long, and seemingly unstoppable decline in U.S. domestic oil production. These developments have overturned many assumptions that people have had about the future course of our energy policy. And it would not be too much to, uh, of an exaggeration to put these technologies in the category of disruptive technologies. This is not the only example, of course, of how innovation has played and is continuing to play a game-changing role in re reshaping our energy future. RPE is precisely designed to seek out and fund new disruptive technologies to meet our energy challenges, whether it's programs to develop non-food crops that directly produce transportation fuel, to advance thermal energy storage and grid-scale electric storage, to dramatically improve batteries or to develop cost-effective alternatives to rare earth elements in energy applications. RPE is making a difference. 
by making strategic investments and leveraging substantial private sector funding of these advanced technologies in the process. RPE is a key element, but not the only element, in what, what one might characterize as an ecosystem of energy innovation in the country. There are other important parts to that, to that ecosystem, both on the technical side and on the policy side. On the technical side, let me just uh, mention three uh, important additional elements at the Department of Energy that complement the work of RPE. The first is basic research led by individual investigators. The second is frontier research carried out by groups. And the third is the larger innovation hubs that try to put the technology pieces together in a much larger context. Individual investigator research at the Office of Science, the larger group uh, groups that are funded either at our national laboratories and by also uh, uh, by these energy frontier research centers and the more macro approach taken by energy innovation hubs all complement on the technical side the high risk, high reward programs that RPE supports. But to have a major effort on energy on our energy future, all of these technical initiatives need to be supported by forward-leaning energy policy. It's not enough to innovate and invent and then to hope for the best in terms of technology adoption and diffusion. Our national and international energy systems are, are complex. They do not operate according to pure free market principles. They are already highly regulated by international and national and regional and even local entities, from OPEC setting global targets for the amount and price of world oil production to your local zoning board deciding whether you can install a solar panel on your roof. So because of that reality, we have no choice but to try to define and to implement the most sensible energy policies we can, because to do nothing is in itself a choice, and it's a choice uh, for uh, essentially leaving these issues up to a random set of policies. Today we face some very formidable obstacles to adopting energy policy that can link up with inter energy innovation. The first and most obvious obstacle, if you've been watching the news recently, is partisan politics. Energy and energy prices in particular is seen as a convenient place to launch political attacks during an election year and in the process of trying to use energy as a political wedge issue, various parts of the energy spectrum get identified as either Republican or as Democratic territory. And constructing a sensible overall energy policy in that context becomes very difficult. Because of the heightened level of partisanship in energy over the last five years, we've seen an unraveling of what up until recently was a fairly strong bipartisan consensus on energy policy. In 2005 and 2007, Congress enacted two major energy policy bills as well as a major innovation bill in the form of the America Competes Act. Those bills reflected a general push toward cleaner sources of energy, uh, harnessing three different policy tools. The first tool was regulation, particularly in the area of, of improved energy efficiency. The second tool was increased spending on innovation and deployment of advanced technologies. And the third tool was tax incentives to make energy adoption more affordable. At the same time that those two bills in 2005 and 2007 were enacted, they, they employed these tools to advance clean energy. They also recognized that existing sources of energy, such as coal and oil and natural gas, would continue to be needed as we made a transition to a cleaner energy mix. It would be fair to say that all three of these policy tools that commanded bipartisan political consensus five years ago are now under sustained attack. 
In terms of the policy tools of regulation, one of the most effective long-term provisions in the 2007 Energy Independence and Security Act was a set of consensus standards to improve efficiency both in appliances but particularly in lighting. Those standards in the lighting area, those standards were agreed to and, and are still supported by a broad coalition of efficiency advocates and the affected industry. And based on that consensus, the U.S. lighting industry made substantial investments over the last five years in reworking their product lines and their manufacturing facilities. Today, we can walk into any Home Depot or Lowe's and see a wide range of lighting choices from improved incandescence to LED light bulbs, all of which guarantee to save the consumer money. Yet these efficiency standards have become fodder for political attacks on cable TV and in Congress, and even though there's a reasonable consensus in industry on other new efficiency standards that would be desirable and to implement, uh, it's probable that we could not pass a bill at this time uh, to put in place uh, any such improved efficiency standards. In terms of policy tools, increasing spending and technology innovation and deployment, we also face some strong political headwinds. One of the strong areas of bipartisan agreement in past bills was to provide loan guarantees and other financing support for the development of the first few of a kind major projects involving advanced energy technologies. I doubt we could have seen the first new nuclear plant in 30 years move forward over the last month without the existing commitment to that sort of financing support. And the loan guarantees uh, financed by the Recovery Act, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, have made possible the construction of numerous new clean energy technology projects at scale. Those projects will allow the market to understand what the actual cost and schedule is for deploying these technologies, and that will allow capital markets to function more efficiently in the future. But all, all I have to do is to say the word Solyndra, and you know that uh, the bipartisan consensus on energy project financing has evaporated. It's evaporated in favor of an attempt to paint the loan guarantee program as some sort of big government scandal for use in the upcoming election. The third policy tool is tax policy. Uh, it is an area that uh, has helped uh, energy projects get, get built in the past. Uh, we just had a very disappointing exercise in trying to renew the production tax credit for wind power projects. That tax credit only applies to projects placed in service by the end of this year. Any wind project that not already under construction now will not be finished in time to qualify. So the incentive effect of the tax credit for wind energy is now uh, rapidly uh, disappearing. We tried to extend the tax credit during the recent consideration of the payroll tax cut bill that passed the Congress this month, but the issue was declared not uh, open for discussion by House leadership uh, in those uh, negotiations. We probably will see major retrenchment all along the supply chain for wind energy this year as a result with the loss of thousands of jobs. And those are good jobs, those are energy jobs, but in our current political context, they are apparently not the right kind of energy jobs. So we face a very challenging environment this year for moving energy innovation forward at the national level. We might have to wait until the results of this fall's election are in before we can make further progress. In the meantime, there is a lot that we can do to lay the groundwork for new ideas that might find a way forward uh, when the current level of partisanship uh, uh, abates. One of these ideas is the proposal for a clean energy standard for electricity production. This is not inherently a partisan proposal. In the last Congress, during the discussion of the renewable electricity standard in the Senate, several Senate Republicans publicly voiced their support for a more inclusive standard 
such as a clean energy standard that would encompass all cleaner forms of electricity production, including nuclear and hydropower. So at the beginning of this Congress, President Obama moved in their direction by making a proposal in a clean, for a clean energy standard in his 2011 State of the Union address. He, he endorsed that proposal again in his State of the Union address this year. Over the last year, I've uh, worked to develop a proposal for a simple and effective clean energy standard. I will be introducing that tomorrow. Uh, it will take all electricity generating technologies that exceed the carbon efficiency of the current state-of-the-art supercritical coal generation and award them credits scaled to their relative improvement in carbon intensity over that baseline. Zero carbon sources uh, such as new nuclear and renewables will get a full credit per kilowatt hour produced. Advanced coal technologies such as oxy-fuel combustion will get partial credit. Natural gas will get about a half a credit based on uh, emissions uh, and so on. Utilities that sell electricity at retail will acquire and turn those credits in to meet a standard that overall will start off being fairly easy to meet. That standard, though, becomes cleaner and more stringent over time. The result is intended to be a realistic and predictable market pull on advanced energy technologies. By having a long-term predictable market for advanced electricity generation, we provide innovators with the confidence and the ability to reach out and make their very best case to investors and to project financiers. I don't entertain the illusion that the proposal will sweep through Congress and get signed into law this year, but I think it's important. It's an important discussion to have this year. It's important to carefully examine a concrete proposal for how a clean energy standard might be constructed. Uh, our current system of on and off tax incentives, while partially helpful to new energy technology deployment, has proven not to be the sort of sustained signal that is really needed in order to unleash innovation in the marketplace. So we need more predictable long-term policy signals if we want energy innovation to truly flourish. And if there are better ideas for how to do that than a clean energy standard, I hope some of those will come forward as we discuss the proposal that I'm going to make tomorrow. As a nation, we possess incredible material and human resources as well as remarkable natural resources for energy and how to spur energy innovation that fully uses those resources is one of our most uh, pressing questions. The answer to that question uh, is multifaceted. Partly it requires breakthroughs in energy technology. I'm very glad that ARPA-E has been so successful in advancing new ideas and inventions of great commercial potential. Other facets of the answer must, must be addressed in, in the broader social system of technology deployment and energy utilization. The best forward-leaning energy policy is one that is truly comprehensive across all these facets, from initial discovery to well-functioning markets. If all of these are needed, if the United States is to lead in the advanced energy technologies that will power the 21st century. Thank you for the essential role that you have already played in the broad spectrum of addressing our energy challenges, and I wish you the best in your work at the frontiers of energy innovation. Thank you very much.